Hey everybody, Sean McMahon here. Welcome to the Workman Song Channel. Today is Mystical Monday. Now I just want to share some studies I've been doing. I've been getting deep into temple theology. Now nominal temple theology is kind of new. It basically all goes back to a British woman and former Methodist pastor named Margaret Barker. I'm going to be talking more about her work as I continue studying it, but she just has this fantastic way of looking at the Old Testament and the New Testament through the lens of temple theology, or what in the Bible might be called temple typology. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that a lot of what I'm about to share with you was inspired by Margaret Barker's work. It certainly is. Though she's a Protestant, she has done a lot of work that's of great interest to Catholics on The Lady, aka The Mother of the Lord. And this is a great book. I just started it. My familiarity with Margaret Barker's work right now is mainly through her YouTube lectures. And I'm reading The Mother of the Lord and her other book, The Great Angel, kind of at the same time. I want to talk more about Margaret Barker's work with more specificity at another time. But what I do want to do now is share some of the things that I've been thinking about while I have been studying her stuff. And this is basically how it started. She has a number of lectures online that are about the lady clothed with the sun in Revelation 12. And it really got me thinking because her take on that is that it's possible the entirety of the revelation of Jesus Christ was actually a vision given to Jesus Christ, which of course he then shared with his apostles, or at least John, but originally given actually to Jesus Christ himself. Possibly, she speculates, at his baptism, when he was anointed in the Holy Spirit, and that this vision is what informed his ministry. Her take is that the vision of the lady clothed with the sun in Revelation 12 is Christ's vision of a certain part of Hebrew history. Now that was my jumping off point. I have always looked at the lady clothed in the sun as the Jerusalem who is above giving birth to the church. That's Mary and Jesus. And these are frankly conventional and traditional um, connections to make. Jerusalem, Mary, man-child with the iron rod, Jesus Christ. Now, Margaret Barker has her own take on this my take, I think, is a little different. The only reason I say I think is because I haven't read all of her work. She has about 19 books. So, Margaret Barker, if you're watching, either I'm about to say a bunch of stuff that you've already said and I don't know it, or I'm taking some of your ideas in a slightly different direction, you might find it of interest. At any rate, anyone who's interested might find these ideas compelling and food for thought. Now, I want to talk about Revelation 12 and the woman in Revelation 12, and I'm going to connect her to the woman riding the beast in Revelation 17. And what I'm starting to study and set out is that this might be the same woman. Th these might not be new ideas, but they're somewhat new ideas to me. I don't know if this is what Margaret Barker says, but again, her work has been a jumping off point. Any commentary on Revelation 12 and the lady of Revelation 12 needs to start at the end of Revelation 11. There weren't chapter breaks originally, and the vision of the lady is actually seen in the temple. Revelation 11 verse 19 is the segue to this vision in Revelation 12. It reads, Then the temple of God in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. Now that's significant. At some point, just before the Babylonian invasion, the ark was removed from the temple. The Deuterocanonical Maccabees says that Jeremiah removed it and put it in safekeeping in a cave. There is a messianic expectation that this ark would be seen again one day when the Messiah comes again. We need to have this messianic association in mind. Whether it's a messianic expectation or association is a little bit more ambiguous to me with this reading, and I'll tell you why in a moment. So there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm, and then a great sign appeared. A woman clothed in the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and crying out in the pain and agony of giving birth. Lo and behold, the ark is seen again. It's in the temple, but it's not it. It's a sheep. The woman is the ark and of course catholics have been saying for millennia that mary the mother of the lord is the ark of the covenant she's the new ark and then another sign appeared in heaven remember these are signs a huge red dragon with seven heads ten horns and seven royal crowns on his heads remember that 
His tail swept a third of the stars from the sky, tossing them to the land. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, ready to devour her child as soon as she gave birth. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where God had prepared a place for her to be nourished for 1,000 years. 260 days. Now I want to stop there. Now there is a wisdom tradition in the Old Testament. If you read the wisdom of Solomon, it's especially explicit that wisdom is this female figure who gives birth to everything or through whom everything is conceived. And you see her again in the New Testament when Paul says the Jerusalem above is free and we are her children. And Jesus, of course, says that wisdom is justified of her children. And so while this imagery at the beginning of Revelation 12 definitely seems to be Jerusalem who is above and Mary giving birth to the church, the body of Jesus Christ. Well, Mary and Jesus Christ are not signs. They are the fulfillment. Jesus Christ, of course, is the incarnation of the Son of God. And St. Maximilian Kolbe calls Mary the quasi-incarnation of wisdom. So what we're reading in Revelation 12 are signs. So it occurred to me that given that the New Testament is explicit that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament types and shadows, aka signs, my wheels started turning saying maybe this is an older sign more along the lines of these ancient types and shadows than we've initially thought. This could be about the distant past, which might seem weird for a book of prophecy, but Remember Revelation 1, 19 says, write down what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. Revelation is not just about things that are contemporary to John or future to John. He's seeing things past tense also. Maybe this sign is about the birth of Israel, the firstborn son of God, according to Exodus 4.22. Now, what's even more interesting, if we're going to look at it this way, is this concept of her fleeing into the wilderness where God has prepared a place for her to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now, anyone interested in the woman, in the bride of Christ, in this female figure that is intimately connected with the God of the Old Testament and the New, you're going to want to read Hosea, the prophecies of Hosea, because the entirety of this short prophecy is about the marriage between God and Lady Jerusalem or Lady Wisdom or whatever you want to call her. Because in Hosea, you read about the infidelity of the wife of, of God, who interestingly enough brings grain, wine, and oil offerings, which by the way were the offerings made to Asherah in the Old Testament, the Queen of Heaven, okay? When Hosea 2, the punishment for this female figure's infidelity is, I will make her naked, I will make her like a desert, a parched land, and she will die of thirst, but I will allure her tenderly, where? In the wilderness. So this lady is driven into the wilderness. Now it says it's for 1,260 days. Other commentators of the Bible have noticed that 1,260 days are basically three and a half years. And that's a crucial measure of time in the Bible. That's half a jubilee. Half a jubilee is the length of Christ's ministry. It's also the length of the Jewish wars that basically culminated all Old Testament prophecy and led to the destruction of Jerusalem. So this is a very important measure of time, 1,260 days. But I got to wondering if this image is actually the sign the type and shadow of the coming of Christ. And this is talking about the history of Israel itself. What if this is about the birth of Israel? And I did a little research, and according to Chabad.org, when Joshua arrived in Canaan, he distributed the land to all of the 12 tribes, and that was 1,260 BC. 1,260 BC. Give or take, 1,259, 58, before the birth of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the real Son of God, to whom all of the signs of the Old Testament were pointing. And by the way, in the prophecies of Hosea, what happens after this time in the wilderness? There is a new covenant and all becomes well. Isn't it interesting that just so happens 
that 1,260 years before the birth of Christ, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament typology, the lands of Canaan are appointed to the 12 tribes. Okay, and this land, we are told in the New Testament, was not the actual substance of the promise made to Abraham, but Christ is. The time of the Old Testament is recontextualized in the New Testament. The Old Testament era itself is likened unto the wandering in the wilderness after the Exodus. Galatians 4.25, the Old Covenant and Jerusalem on earth are likened to Mount Sinai, that is the mountain that's in the wilderness of Arabia. So the entire history of Israel is being presented by St. Paul in Galatians as a wandering in the wilderness. This is the time in the wilderness. And repeatedly throughout prophecy, the land of Jerusalem and Israel throughout all the years of infidelity is repeatedly called a wilderness, a desert. The way I'm reading this right now is when the woman flees into the wilderness, this is her time of sojourn in Canaan. You know, you read in Ezekiel 16, speaking to this woman, this female figure, whether it's wisdom, Jerusalem, it's really hard to put your finger on it. Your father was an Amorite, your mother was a Hittite, meaning you're a Canaanite. Now, here's where it gets even more interesting. Okay, because we've already heard about the huge red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, just like the beast, and we're going to talk about the beast later. But war breaks out in heaven. Michael and his angels fight against the dragon, and he's cast out of heaven. Now, this sounds a little bit like when Jesus sends out the 70, they come back and they say, we're casting out devils in your name. And he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, Margaret Barker pointed out, he didn't say when he saw that. He could have been talking about, yes, I saw it while you were out there. You cast Satan out of heaven. Or he could have been referring to his vision his revelation that John is relaying in the book of Revelation. So it could refer to something that happened in the past. And by the way, the Psalms record something exactly like this in Psalm 82. It says, Elohim presides in the divine assembly. He renders judgment among the Elohim. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked, etc., etc.? And what happens, he says, I have said you are gods. You are Elohim, you are sons of El Elyon, sons of the Most High. But like mortals, you will die, and like rulers, you will fall. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. So this sounds exactly like someone getting caught up to the throne of God, being given the power and authority to judge all the nations. Unjust judges who are partial to the wicked are being sentenced to death, they are being thrown out of heaven, and they are rulers who are sentenced to a fall. Sounds a lot like the war in heaven and the fall of Satan in Revelation 12, doesn't it? The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan. Clear identification, the deceiver of the whole world. And he was hurled down where? To the land, to the land, and his angels with him. So I'm thinking it's saying he was hurled down to the land of Canaan. Okay. Okay. And then it says, now have come the salvation, the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers have been thrown down. He who accuses them day and night before our God, they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so as to shy from death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens and you who dwell in them. Why? Because Satan and his legion have been cast out of the heavens where they used to be. But woe to the land and sea. This is important. With great fury, the devil has come down to you, knowing he only has a short time. Woe to the land and sea. These are symbols for the Hebrews and the Gentiles. Verse 13, when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the land, right, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle to fly from the presence of the serpent to her place in the wilderness where she was nourished for a time, times, and half a time. And it sets the 1,260 days. Now, about these wings like the eagle, this is something that's a little beyond me, and I'm going to point to Margaret Barker, who reads the prophecy of the Son of Righteousness rising with healing in its wings as the Son of Righteousness rising with healing in her wings, because apparently the Masoretic Hebrew is corrupted in the original was a female 
reference. And she says that this refers to the symbol of the Davidic monarchy, which is to say the Melchizedek monarchy, a son with wings. And this is a symbol not just of the monarchy, but specifically of Lady Wisdom in the throne of God, which is what the mother of the king is often called. Again, if you haven't read Margaret Barker, I'll have to summarize this more in other videos. And then from the mouth of the serpent spewed water like a river, remember that, to overtake the woman and sweep her away in the torrent. But the earth helped the woman and opened its mouth to swallow up the river that had poured from the dragon's mouth. This is interesting. At first, I'm like, what is this? This is like a flood? Is this flood imagery from the times of Noah? Well, that's not a flood of a river. There is a river flood in prophecy, and that's in Isaiah 8, when Isaiah is prophesying against the people of Israel. Check this out. Isaiah 8, verse 6 following. Because this people has rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh and rejoiced in Raisin and the son of Amalia, the Lord will surely bring against them the mighty flood waters of the Euphrates River. That is the king of Assyria and all his pomp. It will overflow its channels and overrun its banks. It will pour into Judah, into the land, swirling and sweeping over it, reaching up to the neck. Its spreading streams will cover your entire land, O Emmanuel. That sounds a lot like the land swallowing up the water to me. Now, it says that the land comes to help the lady in this way by swallowing it up. Bear that in mind. It goes on, it says, the dragon was enraged at the woman and went to make war with the rest of her children. Okay, now Mary doesn't necessarily have more children. Of course, the church does. But when we're looking at even older typology, Lady Wisdom, again, the lady, she does have lots of children. In Hosea, in Ezekiel, there are multiple children. And they're the children of adultery, it says, but it says that one day they'll all be restored. And look how this passage ends. The dragon stood on the sand of the sea. Now, I always used to just wonder, what does that mean to stand on the sand of the sea? What's the sand of the sea? Go back to Hosea, our prophet, who is heavily represented in Revelation. Hosea 1.10, the Israelites will be like the sand of the sea, who cannot be measured or counted. And by the way, this is that beautiful prophecy where he says, in a place where it's said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. But Israel is the sand of the sea. So think about these connections. Revelation 12, could be read as the birth of Israel in the land. And what's even more fascinating is that the son who will rule with a rod of iron is caught up to God and its throne. And then the woman flees into the wilderness, into the, the desert, and dwells there for 1,260 days or years, starting from the time of the allotment of the Canaanite lands to the 12 tribes. Now this apparently causes a war in heaven. And I know that the language here is Christian because it says, now have come the salvation and power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. But again, it says right at the beginning that this whole scenario is a sign. And what are we told in the Bible? That what happened in the first century in Christ, when the lamb was slain, even though he was slain in the first century, he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And the mystery of the gospel was hidden from all the ages. These are eternal realities. Christ was always there in the beginning. He was there in the beginning with God, right? According to the prologue of John's gospel. And the prophets who saw the throne of God and saw the Son of Man sitting upon it were terrified because who were they seeing? They were seeing Jesus Christ before his incarnation, right? So even though we see this explicitly Christian language in Revelation 12, that doesn't mean that this vision is of something that occurred in the first century. And I submit that it's very possible that this is a more ancient vision or it's an, a vision of more ancient things. This red dragon, who is this red dragon? It says it's the devil and Satan and he spews this river and the land swallows it up. Now that's important. The river in Isaiah is the Assyrian invasion. And of course, there's more torrents from these curses because after Assyria, comes Babylon, and then after Babylon, it's Persia, and after Persia, it's Greece, after that, it's Rome. And in every case, these powers, these river floodwaters that come in, they are absorbed into the land. That is, there is a marriage between the occupying power and the land of Israel. The land swallows up this water. That is, the land is drinking the water. It says the lady herself is being nourished 
during this time, which I submit might be 1,260 years of Hebrew history in the land of Israel. Now, hitherto, I always thought that maybe this was the last time we saw this woman because she's this pure woman and she's this heavenly woman. But there is another woman who appears in Revelation, isn't there? So you go over to Revelation 17 and we see the great prostitute who sits on many waters. The kings of the land were immoral with her, and those who dwell on the land were intoxicated with the wine of her immorality. So there's this drinking imagery returning, and of course there's gonna be more. Verse three, and the angel carried me away in the spirit, where? Into the wilderness, where I saw a woman, a woman in the wilderness. Where did we hear about a woman in the wilderness? Revelation 12. And she's sitting on a scarlet, beast as in a red beast much like the dragon is red that was covered with blasphemous names and had oh boy seven heads and ten horns go back to revelation 12 count the heads and the horns on that red dragon who's the devil and serpent this is the same beast the scarlet beast is the red dragon verse 4 the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet that is priestly garments, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. She held in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her fornication. On her forehead was a mysterious name, Babylon the Great, Mother of Prostitutes. That's what God's bride is called in the Old Testament when she's unfaithful. Mother of Prostitutes and of all the abominations of the land. And I could see that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and witnesses for Jesus. And I was utterly amazed at the sight of her. This sounds an awful lot like the lady from Revelation 12. And it sounds like this period of being nourished. But what is this nourishment? It's water that is spewed out of the mouth of the red dragon. But this water is making her drunk. There, and there's so much Old Testament imagery that mingles water with blood. And it's meaningful. When we are baptized, we are baptized into the blood of Christ. So water serves as a type of blood. And so what's going on is she is drinking the the water out of the red dragon's mouth. And she's essentially appropriating all the ways of the nations and the land is becoming corrupt and there are abominations. Now this is important. I have often thought, and pretty much my thinking on this was sealed and done for a while, that the red dragon is a symbol of Rome, especially because it says later that the seven heads are seven mountains. Rome has seven mountains or seven hills, right? Well, so does Jerusalem. According to BibleStudy.org, Jerusalem's seven hills are Mount Scopus, the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Corruption, Mount Ophel, the original Mount Zion, and the new Mount Zion, and then the hill on which the Antonia fortress was built. And not only that, everyone scratches their heads when it comes to this question of the beast that you saw, it was, now is no more, but is about to come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. It's like, how does this square with Rome? Because Rome was alive and well. And guess what? Maybe it doesn't square with Rome. But I can tell you this. When we read about the cross in the epistles and the books of Acts, it says that this has abolished the old law. But our prophets tell us there is going to be an apostasy and there's going to be a tribulation and a great war very briefly and the devil is going to be let loose very briefly and he's going to go to war and he's going to lose now i don't know if anyone noticed this but in AD 70 there was a great war and rome was not the one to lose it was the zealots it was those who were zealous for the law who lost it was those fighting for the land and fighting not for the lamb, but for the beast. And I want to go back now to look a little more at the beasts. Because, of course, as you know, there are two beasts in Revelation. They come up right after Revelation 12. So, there's a beast. It, it doesn't say that it's scarlet in Revelation 13. But it identifies the beast with ten horns and seven heads rising out of the sea. That is, out of the Gentile nations. And we have further evidence of this because it talks about the leopard and the feet of the bear, which are associated with the Gentile nations that ruled over Israel. And by the way, this wasn't a total aberration. The king of Persia, Cyrus, is called the anointed of God. As in, King Cyrus was anointed by the God of the Hebrews to be king of the Jews. These are nations that are appointed by God to rule over Israel. That is to say, all of these nations are part of who Israel is. Israel is in a marriage with these 
nations. So the beasts don't signify the Gentile nations. The beast signifies Israel. Nay, more specifically, the lady that we see in Revelation and throughout prophecy, the bride, the prostitute, the mother of prostitutes, etc., as married to these different nations at a given time. One of the heads of the beast appeared to be mortally wounded. I submit to you that that's the wound inflicted by Christ. But the mortal wound was healed and the whole world marveled and followed the beast. They worshiped the dragon who had given authority to the beast. They worshiped the beast. And this beast is given a mouth to speak arrogant and blasphemous words and authority to act for 42 months. That is the length of the Jewish war in the first century. The beast was permitted to wage war against the saints and to conquer them. And it did, that was the tribulation. And it was given authority over every tribe and people and nation and tongue. And all who dwell on the land will worship the beast. All those whose names have not been written from the foundation of the world and the book of life belonging to the land who was slain. Okay, and it says that this, there's more, but it says that this is a call for the perseverance of the saints. That is, this is relevant to you first century Christians. This is going to affect you very shortly, is basically what John's saying. And then he sees another beast rising out of the land. So we would associate this with Israel, right? Well, this is where it's interesting, because we've basically established that the sea beast actually is apostate Jerusalem. So why would the land beast also be that? No, the land beast is something different. At this point, this is being written by Christians. Christians believe that they are Israel. So there is a beast arising out of the land, that is out of the true Israel. So if it's arising out of the land, that is the true Israel, then it's arising out of the church. And it had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. This is the false church. This is what the epistles are talking about when they're saying that there are false brethren coming in to spy us out, to infiltrate our ranks, to Judaize, to enslave us again to the law, and they're going out, that is to say, arising out of our midst, out of the church, and starting their own false churches, their own synagogues of Satan. And of course, it's getting the authority to do this from the first beast, which is to say from apostate Jerusalem, probably from the Sanhedrin, etc. Much like St. Paul, while he was Saul, was given papers uh, and was given authority to persecute Christians. In this case, these are infiltrators of the church, the false church. So it looks like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. And this beast requires everybody to get this mark on their forehead, whether rich or poor, free and slave, no one can buy or sell unless they have the mark. Now, the Old Testament prophets foretold this time of buying without money, right? Getting, getting the water of life and getting spiritual food Come and buy without money. Isaiah 55 talks about this. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. This is about grace. And the Judaizers of the false church are saying, no, you got to wear this mark of the law. You got to bear the curse of the law. A mark is a curse. Go back to Genesis, right? The curse slash mark of Cain. You have to bear the marks of the law. You have to be circumcised. You have to obey the law in order to buy and sell, which is to say in order to be a part of this community that was foretold by Isaiah. How does this apply to the number of the beast 666? Frankly, I don't know. I don't do gematria. I know that there is a very solid case that this relates to Caesar Nero, and I, I don't have a problem with that. I'm just saying... This is a new dimension of these scriptures that I'm starting to peer into, and I feel like I'm just at the precipice of this deeper dive. So as I continue to look into these things, I'm going to share updates. I didn't really script out my thoughts, so if, if this comes off a little jumbled, I'm happy to answer questions in the comments, and I can make more videos when I have more time. And I definitely want to go on some level into depth about Margaret Parker's work, because Man, the depth of her scholarship is so fascinating and explains so much, not just about Hebrew history, but also the early church. So whether you're Catholic or not, this is important stuff, and, and she's doing a great job with it. I highly recommend you check out her work and her lectures, which are all on YouTube. But yeah, let me know what you think of this level of interpretation and any thoughts that you were inspired to jot down and maybe look deeper into because of what I've been sharing Feel free to drop that in the comments. I'm eager to pursue this direction of study. For those of you who are interested in eschatology, I am too. And part of why I'm pursuing this direction is because I am seeing a lot of eschatology 
in the early church being formulated in terms of Christology. And this is highly Christological stuff. Because at the end of the day, Christ is the embodiment of everything that we read about in the Old Testament. And it gets deep. And temple theology is a big part of that. In fact, it's a massive part of it. In understanding who this lady is, it's not just lady, we're not just saying woman or girl, it's lady with a capital L, as in lords and ladies. This is an honorific title. This lady is extremely important. And the fact that she shows up in Revelation is important because she shows up a virgin, gives birth to the firstborn child, Israel, has other children that are pursued, just like in Hosea, and then she's condemned as an adulterer, a prostitute, she's stripped naked, she's driven into the wilderness, she's burnt, but then, and I'll get to this in another video because I'm out of time, but then you see her redemption, you see her coming down from heaven as a bride adorned and prepared for her husband, which is exactly what Hosea said would happen. This is all the same lady. And I couldn't help but think of the extra canonical writing thunder perfect mind, where this lady is speaking in the first person, just like in Wisdom of Solomon. In thunder perfect mind, she says, I am the honored one and the scorned one. I am the whore and the holy one. I am the wife and the virgin. I am the mother and the daughter. I am the barren one and many are her sons. I am she whose wedding is great and I have not taken a husband. I could go on. Now, when I first read these words years ago, before I was even a Christian, I was like, oh, cool. It's just antitheses. It's very, you know, very Buddhist. I mean, like, literally, I pretty much thought it was like, oh, it's like that Alanis Morissette song. Like, I'm a bitch. I'm a lover. I'm a child. I'm a mother. I'm a sinner. I'm a saint. I do not feel ashamed. I'm your hell. I'm your dream. I'm nothing in between. Now you know I didn't want it any other way. That song, like, grew up listening to that song on, on rock radio. Now I recognize that all of these are from the Old Testament. These are all prophetic images from the Old Testament. Directed at Jerusalem, who's right, who's simultaneously the, the daughter of Zion, but also the mother of the church, right? The mother and the daughter at the same time. So there's a lot to unpack here. But again, the happy ending is just like Hosea said, and just like you see at the end of Revelation. At the end, she, like her husband, is resurrected and comes down out of heaven. And there's a great wedding feast. Now, all y'all Catholics out there in Eastern Orthodox, get to Mass on Sunday, because that is the wedding feast. And you get to see that happen in sacrament every Sunday. Anyway, I gotta get going. Thanks for listening. Peace.